lot of, he was li- a lot of guys literally burnt out, yeah. <laughs> well, you said that. What about visiting... We had a lot of obviously visiting Americans that came over and things. How did you get on with those guys? What did you think to some of them? Because a lot of them now have gone on to great success. And I, can, I mean, obviously, I was around for all of these shows as well. Uh, and I got to meet a lot of these people. Um, and it, it's interesting because I could give my opinions on them now and I would I would sound like um, the biggest asshole in the world if I was to give my opinion on a few of them that I've met because uh, one of them who is literally um, the biggest missing um, wrestling star now, <laughs> let's put it that way, when I met him, was the biggest dickhead of all time. I, uh, I quite and, liked him. I, you, let, you liked well, we him. Did it, see, I, I got an interview. See, I, I, we, we, did it, we did an interview for Power Slam. So... You know, I had some chance. To, I, had, I had chance to sit. We're talking about CM Punk. Of yeah. course, yeah. Um, uh, I had chance to sit down with him in in the in, in the salubrious surroundings of the Southbury Leisure Centre Canteen in Enfield, and just have a chat with him. You know, and, and he and he came across okay. And I think, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I know Dean Ayers uh, didn't like him either. <laughs> Uh, my fellow British wrestling manager, uh, stemming from an incident when they he drove Punk. Uh, between shows, and they had a falling out over some comment Dean made um, about a Chinese buffet. I think that's in the book as well. Um, but yeah, I know I never read that actually. I never that. read that. Yeah. No. Dean, Dean, Dean didn't like him, but I mean, you take people as you find them, don't you? And I, I found him to be, um, and we when we was doing the um, the gigs before Uprising, you know, when we were doing the fan signings and the the what we did, what did they call it when they did it at the at the nightclub before we actually did the shows, you know, the, the like the fan conventions yeah. and things like that. I find him just to be incredibly rude to the fans, and I, I can't imagine how he would be now with the position that he's in and things now. So, yeah, but it's interesting. And, and then I found some of the other guys, like Hamrick and yeah. those kind of people, really polite and, and things. So it is interesting to, uh, to, to meet these guys. But I, I used to find a lot of the travelling Americans, because... Um, somebody had paid for them to come over to the country. Um, a lot of them would come over with a chip on the shoulder, uh, thinking, "Well, they've flown me over, so I must be a something. I must, I must be a somebody." Uh, and I did find that with quite a few of them. I have to say. Yeah, maybe, but I think you know. I, I don't know if it's necessarily you, you can say it's an American or an overseas thing. I think that even in in Britain, you meet you meet some wrestling wrestling people who. You click with, and they're absolutely wonderful. And other other people, you know, the, the vast majority of people, I think, are just acquaintances. You know, work colleagues. You shake the hand, you say hello. You don't you don't socialise with many people. You don't have much of a conversation about you know your personal life with with many people, irrespective of where they come from. And you know, most yeah, most of the Americans I found, I think, kept themselves to themselves really, and were just like you know, you'd exchange pleasantries, and that was it. Uh, people I probably got on best with from the America, from 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 North America, people like Joe Legend, D'Lo Brown, Steve Carino, uh, Raven. I got on famously with, but again, he was a hard guy to get to know. He was very, you know, a lot of them are quite guarded. I think until you get to know them, and I think it's just a case of the more time you spend with some of these people, breaks the ice, and, and you get on better. I'm surprised that Steve Carino liked you after the, the um, hotel accommodation you put us all in that night. To be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my lord, that would be the famous night we all went to Crystal Teas. Um, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can just, just describe Crystal Teas. I'm assuming that's quite a famous night in Morecambe Crystal Teas. Oh, it was. It's, it's not there anymore. That's that shut down as well. It? Another one that's gone. Pretty much everything in Morecambe. Yeah, that was a great night. Myself, Doug Williams, James Ty, Hayd Vanson, and Steve Carino and Colt Cabana. Uh, we all went out to. Yeah, this was a great night. We all went out, and we couldn't find many places open. Um, so we all went out, and we ended up in Crystal Tees. Uh, and the second you walked in, you know, your feet were sticking to the floor. And uh, we, we, we sat down, and as soon as we sat down, we ordered a drink. And I could hear Colt Cabana had just arrived in the country. And I could hear Scott saying, Colt Cabana, I could hear him saying to this guy, Yeah, man, we're all wrestlers. We've just arrived. I've just arrived in the country. All of us guys, we're all wrestlers. And I was thinking, oh, no. Please don't say that. You're going to get us into a fight instantly. And then I could hear one guy screaming at the bar, there ain't no black in Union Jack. And I thought, oh, no. Then they all started um, looking at Hayd Vanson, who is obviously um, not not white of skin. (laughs) 
and the next thing you know, the whole place just went up, and we're all fighting, and yeah, yeah, Steve Carino was with us. It was a mental night, absolutely mental. But a great memory of coming to Morecambe. Thank you very much, Greg. You'll be very welcome. But, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're a poor little North Lancashire seaside town, you know. And a lot of people, a lot of American uh, people I've spoken to say it's very, Morecambe is the British equivalent of Asbury Park, New Jersey. Abs- yeah, I've never been there, but I can imagine so. Yeah, yeah. I expect to uh, knock into Bam Bam Bigelow at any point when I'm walking around there. Absolutely. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> so, it was with a ghost the, of him, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately, a ghost of Sadly, him. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so FWA obviously died on Greg, and you uh, started up with your XWA. Yeah. Um, why was this? Why Why did you um, start with your own promotion? Because FWA shows and the FWA Morecambe shows were always two separate entities anyway, because the, the FWA, like you mentioned before, uh, it, was, it was a southern-based wrestling promotion. It was based in, well, initially in Portsmouth and then in London, the London area, and it had, like you say, a travelling fan base, apart from in Morecambe, where we did a lot more to actually attract locals and families, and as a result, the atmosphere at the shows was very different to the show's down south. So when FWA began to lose a bit of its luster, because of the promotions came along, FWA was skint. We didn't have any money at all. And other promotions came along and were putting on these dream matches with Americans for a lot cheaper prices. So the fan, the crowd started to dwindle. But Morecambe always did really well. You know, it, 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 we sold out the Morecambe Dome or came close to it consistently for about six years. Um, so I thought, well, you know, the FWA name is, is becoming a bit of an albatross around the neck now. At this point in time, we should state you'd gone from literally being this this you, this 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 writer that had gone into the FWA. Uh, at this point, you'd gone from being a manager. You'd been asked to help out backstage, uh, and you'd gone through the whole gambit, and you'd literally uh, taken over the running of the FWA. Yeah, because no one else wanted to do it. <laughs> yeah, you, uh, you, you mean in hindsight, you clearly should not have done that. Yes. I definitely should not have done that. This was a, I can get this thing going. And I, I understand what you was you were saying, because it was such a great thing at a great time. And But the, the fans, obviously, in the different parts of the country wanted different things. Yeah, they did. They did. And I, what I tried to do is, is I tried, realising that we, we, we had to do it on a budget now because there was no money around, I, I tried to replicate what I was doing successfully in Morecambe in in various other parts of the country. I know we tried it. We tried it in Cleethorpes, didn't we? And it, it, it um, but in the end, it just wasn't working. I, I tried to. I ran a few shows around the country. Very few of them drew anything remotely impressive. You know, a lot of them drew awful. I mean, you remember the rugby show, oh, where, where yeah. you know there was. It was a bit embarrassing, really. It was it tarnished the legacy of the FWA and. It was just a case of really putting it out of its misery. Well, we went out with a bang. We had a great interpromotional feud with IPW UK, which went very, very well. But then, yeah, my plan all along was to, to start again and um, do it as XWA, which was very similar to FWA. And the reason for that was because we, we didn't want to change it too much for the Morecambe fans, who still, you know, FWA still meant something to them. And this was like March 2007, I think, that we... Or well, April 2007, we ran the first XWA show, and it just carried on like, like it did before. Big, big crowds, great atmosphere, great, great shows. Just carried it that on for about five years. Now, you was a very successful promoter of this. There's a lot of people that have, have tried to run shows, not been successful. People have run shows, been successful, but you consistently did this, literally month after month after month, doing close to near sellouts at this place. Uh, now, I'm gonna, uh, you know. Kiss my own uh, backside a little bit here. I was one of your headliners literally month after month after month. Um, what did you see in me, Greg, that made, that made you put me on top for, the, for your Morecambe shows? What did you look for in a wrestler? What did I see in you? Goodness, that's, that's a hell of a question, isn't it? <laughs> no, no, I mean, it I'm is, generalising in what you saw in me for what you were looking for in a wrestler. Entertainment. You, you, yeah. you, you understood. You always, I, I always learn. I actually learn. I, I feel like I learned quite a lot from you. If, if um, it, it, there's something you always used to say, which I thought made a lot of sense, and that was that, you know, when you when you were on a show, didn't matter whether you were a good guy or a bad guy or whatever, uh, you didn't care about how you didn't put, care about putting on a five star match or you know you, didn't, you all you were interested in 
was that people remembered you afterwards and that you got a reaction. And you were very good at getting a reaction off the crowd. You, 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 were, you were very good at working the crowd. And uh, you, you had that match with Alex in 2005 on the same show as the Pro Wrestling Noah GHC Tag Team Championship match with all these, you know, the top Japanese guys, Marifuji and Suzuki against Doug and Scorpio. That was the main event. But you and Alex stole the show because you connected emotionally with the crowd. They, you were the big underdog taking on the big six foot seven inch arrogant London champion. Um, and although you didn't win, at the end of the match you got up and you, you surveyed the crowd, you just made eye contact and they gave you a standing ovation. And, and that was the reason and the reason why is that I, I, could, I could always rely on you to get a reaction from the crowd. I mean, you, when you were champion in 2008 and, and you won that uh, Gold Rush Rumble, you incited a riot. <laughs> <laughs> you, you won the Rumble cheating, obviously, eliminating Sam Slam after he'd already eliminated you this big muscle-bound superhero that fans absolutely loved. And there's you, slightly pot-bellied, smoking backstage, Stevie Knight. Smoking, smoking as we speak, yes, go on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Loudmouth Stevie Knight, you know, sneaks up, but gets eliminated, referees don't see it, sneaks back in, chucks them out, and the next thing, they are pelting you with plastic bottles, screwed-up rubbish, and that, that was it, and it was a sold-out crowd, and they wanted to see, whether they, they, they either wanted to see you win desperately, or they wanted to see you lose desperately, and that was the reason why you were a headline. Yeah. And it's, this is something I always try and, and, and I say this not as a, I'm not trying to sit here and listen to you build me up by any stretch of the imagination. It's just that I get a lot of people, I've had a lot of emails and things over since the last few shows, uh, saying, oh, you, you talk like it doesn't matter if you have a good match or it doesn't matter if you have, of course it matters if you have a good match. The point that I try and make on the show is that it's more important that you have a match that people remember. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. And it's more important that if a guy has a better match than you, you know, the, on the on the show before you, or a guy has a better match after you, it doesn't matter as long as they remember you. That's all the point that I try and make to people because we get a lot of feedback on the show off the last few shows uh, where people have said that to me. You, you talk like it doesn't matter if you have a great match. I don't think it does matter if you have a great match because if you look at any of the top wrestlers in the world, apart from certain promotions that are, are actually gauged towards that kind of wrestling. Who are the top wrestlers? You know, the top wrestlers are not the people that are having the greatest match all the time. It's the people that shift the merchandise, the people that get a reaction. No matter what kind of reaction it is, it's whether you are getting a reaction. Surely the worst thing is apathy. That's exactly right. And those are the, generally the people who are making the most money as well. Yeah. And, and Wasn't the case working for you, though, Greg? Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you may have been the best of a bad bunch. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there's not a lot of money in British wrestling, is there? But I mean, you're, you're, you're right. I mean, in, Amer in America, you know, you, you're talking about guys like Hulk Hogan, Steve Austin, John Cena. Now, you know, they're the guys who make multi millions, and you know, Hogan, Cena in particular, aren't exactly known for the, you know, the quality of their wrestling ability. Austin more so, but again, Austin is remembered at his peak for the character, for the, the, the attitude era, the redneck, the flipping people off and swearing and drinking beer. And that's what gets you over. We've got a guy in Britain at the moment, who I know you, you know, called Grado, Scottish lad. And I see him in that vein. You know, he's, he's a decent wrestler, but he's a great entertainer and he connects with the audience. They love him. He's the ultimate lovable underdog. Uh, and he's doing really well, having been on um, that BBC One documentary, Insane Fight Club. He's he's getting a bit of acting work off the back of it. He's he's mixing with celebrities. I know he, he did something at the BBC Scotland with Andy Murray's mum, and he's gained about I think he gained about ten thousand Twitter followers. So he's getting his name out there, but not just in wrestling. And he'll yeah. make a decent living outside of wrestling if he's smart with it. Yeah. Uh, that's the way you're going to have. That's the way to make money if you're a British wrestler, because you're not going to make a lot of money just on the British wrestling circuit. You've got to try and get into other avenues. Let's talk about that because this is something that's going on in Britain at the moment. Now, just Grado is on the show next week, incidentally. Yeah. So, um, 
Now, you're around British wrestling at the moment. Have you heard anything negative from any of the other wrestlers about Grado? Because I can...